Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Uncapped Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Sands, and today I'm joined from all the way from Jackson Hole, Wyoming, the founder and the brewmaster of Roadhouse Brewing Company. Uh, Colby Cox is the founder, and Max Schaefer is the brewmaster. Thank you for joining me, gentlemen. You're welcome. Good to be here. So, before we get into important stuff, something has been driving me crazy, and you may not even have any idea what the answer is to this because I may have made it up in my head because Google has been useless. There was a movie or a comedy where they make a big deal about something happening or something about Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Do you have any clue what I'm talking about, or did I make that up in my head? Um, well, I, I think I, I, I have a good idea of what you're, what you're maybe getting at is, a maybe a older movie that's got a pretty tall, suave, blonde dude in it. It's possible. What, what movie? I, like, I'm literally, get a lot like, of people. I literally, all I remember is like some, something I watched and I'm talking constantly about Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And that's all I can remember. And that's why I've been completely useless in trying to figure out what it was. <laughs> we get a lot of people who think we've got a tie to uh, and have a deep love for the uh, Patrick Swayze uh, movie, just simply titled Roadhouse. Uh, oh, yeah. No, this is. Yeah, this is completely unrelated to Roadhouse, just Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Like they, and, and I'm probably just making it up in my head. <laughs> I can't, I can't think of anything. Yeah. Damn it. I was hoping like from being there, like it was something more notable than I mean, most likely I made it up. <laughs> it's like the basement of the Alamo. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so one, uh, I'd normally t start these out by getting a little bit of backstory about the founder of the brewery. So um, Colby, what were you doing when it, that made you decide that you wanted to open a brewery? Um, well, uh, I worked at a brewery when I was young, 14. Um, I worked uh, at Dog Pichette, actually, um, when they were kind of in startup mode. And so I, uh, you know, kind of became enamored with, I mean, before that, um, you know, I had, no idea uh, that there was anything um, like craft beer or difference between, you know, craft beer and, and macro beer or anything like that. So um, that kind of, um, I guess, wet my palate a little bit. And then uh, kind of later on, you know, post-college, I got into home brewing um, pretty hardcore as I get into um, just about anything I do. Um, so, you know, created basically a microbrewery in my garage um, and was doing that for a few years and entering comps and um, somewhat reluctantly um, a guy I was brewing with convinced me that we should start a brewery. Um, I was pretty against it because um, brewing beer was kind of a respite from, you know, my other world of work and chaos and things like that. And, I didn't want to turn a hobby into a job, um, but uh, I had two conditions that I was willing to do, you know, willing to, I guess, try it. One was uh, we were going to start a brewery. Uh, we had to have food. We, you know, it had to be a brew pub of some kind. And the second was uh, I absolutely will not run a restaurant. So there were two kind of juxtaposed ideas. Um, and that led to me partnering with a guy who already owned a restaurant and putting a brewery in that restaurant, which is my partner, Gavin Fine. And um, that was the Roadhouse, uh, the Q Roadhouse restaurant, which is how we got our name, Roadhouse Brewing Company. So, well, it's a good thing you met him then, because those, those two goals are very um, definitely not cohesive with each other. <laughs> yeah, correct. I mean, it was when I first told... The guy I was brewing with, when I first told him, you know, I had two conditions, he kind of looked at me cross-eyed um, because he couldn't understand how we could serve food without running a restaurant. Um, 
but we <laughs> figured we figured it out um, and we made it like super complicated um, and eventually you know that was in 2000, 2012 um, and then we kind of unwound that com complexity um, as we got bigger and moved into our production facility in 2017 and um, started you know distributing in other states we just it, things got much simpler it was just like we're you know we're partners just you know we're making beer we own restaurants um and you know we split everything down the that's pretty much um as simple as it gets i guess so did you grow up in delaware yeah i did i was born in southern delaware um so i kind of uh I was born in, in a town called Lewis, Delaware, um, and my family is all from Milton, Delaware, which is um, where Dogfish Head is. Um, I stayed at so, a bed and breakfast in Lewis once. Yeah. It was a cool little cool town. Little, cool little town, for sure. Um, it, um, it's come a long way. It used to be it's a... Um, it used to have the largest fishery in the area, so it's stunk like shit for um, a long time. And then when the fishery went away, all of a sudden it became this thriving beach community. Um, I was going to say, it didn't stink so, when I was there, thankfully. <laughs> yeah. I got, I got rid of the smell. So how did you end up in Wyoming? Those are not uh, ge geographically similar places. No, you know, it's funny. They're not, but in some way, they're definitely not geographically similar, but um, I would say in terms of character, they're very similar. Um, so, you know, Delaware is kind of, you know, it's the first state. Um, it has a very kind of um, righteous, um, entrepreneurial, um, you know, almost libertarian mindset. Um, you know, kind of, it's a, it's, it gets beat up often because it's so tiny um you know and and but the truth is that delaware has a rich history of you know from the american you know uh, revolution and um you know did amazing things in terms of um you know influencing the outcome of um you know way back in the early days and then you've got wyoming which is very sparsely populated also very similar in terms of you know you know a self-made people who, you know, come out here and kind of made their way with, you know, all kinds of difficult situation. Um, they figured out a way to make it work. And, you know, there's 500,000 people in Delaware. Um, nobody respects either one of them, um, you know, because they're not, you know, California or New York or Illinois. And um, so honestly, there's there's a lot of similarity there. I came to Wyoming to answer your question um, because um, I was traveling a lot for work um, for my other job. And uh, this was before I started a brewery. And in Delaware, uh, the closest airport is two and a half hours away. And so um, it was a major pain in the ass to you know, get from point A to point B. And I figured, listen, if I'm going to, you know, if I could live anywhere, it just has to be near an airport. And I'm just going to pick the place that kind of best suits my lifestyle. Um, and at the time I was into hunting and fishing and um, backpacking and what have you. And so I was like, let's try Jack. I had a good friend here um, who was playing uh, minor league ice hockey. He was my roommate in college, uh, the Jackson Hole Moose. Uh, he encouraged me to come out and stay with him and we went fishing and i fell in love with it um he's actually um a pretty iconic person now we put him on one of our cans um his name is uh, joe casey um so he's no longer with us unfortunately but um he uh he's kind of the mascot behind our beer the highwayman um okay. and we actually own, yeah we own his truck it's kind of sitting out in front of our brewery um so, uh, so anyway, he convinced me to come out. I fell in love. I thought I was going to be here for a year or two, like everybody else. And <laughs> it's been 15, 16 years now. So. It's funny how that happens. Um, so what were you, uh, what was your job 
that you, you wanted to get out of to start a brewery? Can I can you repeat the question? Sorry. Yeah, what 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 were you doing whenever you started the brewery? What what was your job previous? Oh, so I've been in uh, I've been in real estate private equity for eighteen years. Okay. Um, you know is you know has nothing to do with making beer. Um, that is, that's one of the um, one of the semi common previous lives though for uh brewery founders like I, I guess you could lump that kind of into the finance and investor realm because it's like the invest uh, finance um information technology and uh engineers those are seem to be like the three most common previous careers of people who start breweries at least from everyone i've talked to yeah, I mean, I, I would say that, um, you know, so the, I still I still run my private equity company. It's a, um, you know, it's it's a thriving organization. Um, and I, uh, you know, I deal in extremely complex, um, like deal, deal structures. You know, we, we develop um, large master plan communities, like, for example, in San Antonio, Texas, you know, we've got a large master plan community down there that'll be a 15 year project. Um, and what that, uh, the translation of kind of that um, complexity into, you know, I guess the, the world of running a brewery has been extremely helpful. Um, you know, not only from a, you know, understanding the world of finance, you know, and having a lot of kind of deep experience in that world, but also, and, and I would say vice versa. I mean, you know, a lot of what I've been able to do in the brewing world, um, I've brought a lot of skills over into um, into private equity. For example, branding and marketing. Um, uh, that has been, you know, we now, um, a lot of the branding and marketing experience that I've gotten in the brewery has been something I've been able to apply in, in my other world. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of, uh, they're very different businesses. Um, but a lot of transferable skills. That's what I, I've noticed too, like, because I feel like some people, when they don't know completely what they're getting themselves into when they open a brewery, don't realize those aspects of running a brewery and how important that's going to be. Like, that it's way more than just brewing beer. There's that whole business side of it that maybe isn't as glamorous when you first start thinking about opening a brewery, but is essential to being successful and growing. So when, um, when you opened as a, a brew pub, how, um, how large of a brew house did you start out with? Well, can I, can I comment on your previous, what you just said for a second? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Sorry, I just yeah, transitioned because so, I thought you froze up for a second. So I figured I'd just move on to the next question to make it seamless. <laughs> yeah, no problem. No problem. Um, so I find I find that there are two misdirected um, types of business models in craft beer that I've come across. Um, one is kind of the the savvy business-minded person who thinks that they can get into craft beer because it's like any other business, and if they just apply kind of their this acumen into that world, they'll be successful. The other is the kind of you know the personality that you described: somebody who has a real passion for craft beer, um, thinks that because they have this deep passion, that everybody else will celebrate that passion with them. They don't have the say raw skills and business and finance and everything else. And they struggle. I think what's made Roadhouse successful um, is kind of a a, a good um, uh, kind of collaboration of those two things. So, um, for speaking for myself personally, you know, I do have this um, background in business and finance, and um, and you know, even some legal work and what have you. And so, I have this kind of whole area. 
Um, but I have this real true passion for craft beer that comes from like, you know, growing up around it and everything else. And so um, I, I think that if I didn't have one, you know, if I was a little less deficient in either one of those, I think um, I, you know, I personally may not be able to add as much value to Roadhouse as I do. And then I think by extension, the people that we surround ourselves with, you know, I mean, Max, you know, sitting to my right here, you know, bringing a, just a tremendous, you know, I'd say key um, kind of skill sets are like, okay, this like amazing passion and creativity for craft, but also this deep understanding of production and efficiency and, and you know, kind of you know, almost the engineering side of the business. Um, and so like everybody has these kind of dual competencies, you know, that's what we're really looking for. And people as they, um, you know, as, as the candidates at Roadhouse, you know, I, I mentioned that only because, um, you know, I think there's a lot of misguided uh, people out there, you know, I'll just call it your cliche lawyer who decides to start a brewery. Um, who's just like, oh, you know, I, you know, I know how to put all the startup documents together. So why not open a brewery? You know, it's just, and then you go in there and the beer tastes like shit. And I'm not trying to, you know, <laughs> you know, cut anybody down, but it's, you know, it's happening out there. Um, well, yeah, and I think you can definitely tell when that, because one, the brewery rarely has a personality. Like the, the brewery, it's uh, like the, the business itself seems almost sterile because there's someone behind it that's in it just for money and not for the passion of the ha behind the beer that it's they they just looked at it as here's a really pop here's a really popular segment that i need to get into to try to cash in on so i think where you add that added passion also if that's not there i mean you can still be successful but there's definitely there's a very big difference between breweries that run purely by businessmen that looked at it as a way to make money and as ones that were passionate about opening a brewery. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, so, and I, you know, I, I hope that people, um, listen, I, I, I'm with you. I feel that when I walk into other breweries, when I get that sense that they have a passion for their products and I see that they're running their business tight, I, you know, it's almost instant respect. Um, and so, um, anyway, I think that's an important distinction, you know, in a world of 7,000 breweries right now. Um, you know, unfortunately, there's, you know, not a lot of breweries that kind of meet that standard. Um, and we've got plenty of room for more. But um, back to your original question, how big was our brew pub? Is that... Yeah, well, actually, let's um, let's take one real quick uh, sponsor break, and then um, we can dive into the opening of when it was the brew pub before the production area and um, how, how things were then. Uh, so we will be right back. If you haven't heard about our beer dinners, well, now you have. Typically, the last Tuesday of each month, we partner with a local brewery and craft an exclusive five-course dinner. Each course is thoughtfully paired with some of the finest craft beer available. You'll meet the brewery, enjoy memorable pairings and service, and have a damn good time. Like us on Facebook to stay in the know when tickets become available, because they will sell out quick. Idiom Brewing Company proudly offers a delicious variety of beers to satisfy the most discerning taste. Best known for their wide array of IPAs, delicious fruited sours, and robust porters and stouts. Idiom prides themselves on continuing to innovate, utilizing new and experimental hops, local ingredients, and unique flavor profiles. Idiom has a simple goal in mind, to bring people from all walks of life together to enjoy themselves and each other. Idiom Brewing Company is located in downtown Frederick, just south of, south of the intersection of East Street and East Patrick Street, with ample seating and directly on Carroll Creek. So when um, you originally started, it started as, as a brew pub. Um, what size system did you start out with? Uh, we had a seven barrel. And uh, I think we had like three seven barrel fermenters and like one or two 14 barrels. Might so, have even been like a 
a 21 in there. It's, oh yeah, that's right. It was a great learning, learning uh, point. Like people were always like, yeah, we're going to have five barrel brews. We're going to brew in the 15 barrel tanks. Like, ah, oh, you don't want to do triple brew days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Were you, were you there from the beginning, Max? I was not. Uh, I came on in uh, June of 2017, right when we okay. were opening up the big production brewery. But I did get a – Colby and I got a, a good handful, maybe a couple dozen brew days together in, uh, in the original brewery because we had closed that restaurant and the brewery kind of all together but still use it as our pilot system while we were developing a lot of the newer recipes that we've started brewing uh, at the Gregory Brewery. So we, we, I got to brew there. It was an awesome little brew house. It was really sad to – I was tasked with loading it all up onto trucks, and unfortunately, nobody bought it as like a full kit. It was one of these beautiful Newlands copper clad systems. I mean, it was a gorgeous little pub system. Uh, like the it, the um, prototypical uh, brew pub, so it looks pretty. Was it behind a glass glass wall so you could see it? Yep. Guess what? It was uh, um, it was an old billiard room, actually. Um, so they had a pool table in there and you know i you know in the whole like you know serve food but don't own a restaurant conversation i tapped gavin fine on the shoulder and said that pool table's not doing shit for your restaurant um let's, <laughs> let's rip that out and put a brewery in um, let's put something much more useful in its place yeah but for a while i don't i mean like the cue ball was missing for weeks on end or you know like you know, there'd be like two solids and a stripe missing out of it. And you're like, all right, well, <laughs> pull it out, you know, for a second round. You got to hit the, you know, the four in twice. And Cigarette butt shoved in one of the pockets. Yeah. <laughs> so did you, Colby, did you do some of the brewing early on or did you hire a brewer right off the bat? Yeah. So Adam Chenault was our um, original brewer great guy um and uh he's he was the person i was referring to when i said you know um i was home brewing and somebody was kind of pulling on my coattails to start a brewery um so he was our original brewer and uh uh but i did sub in um you know i wouldn't say a lot but i would say you know i had a lot of recipes that i wanted to brew um, and so I would find time in the production schedule to get in there and brew some beer. Um, and I'd like to say that I, um, you know, we still have that kind of system set up at Roadhouse. Um, but it's been a while since I've been able to get in and make a beer. Um, although story for maybe later on in the podcast, you know, Max burned the shit out of his hand a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> Um, I am, oh, no. I was given the option of coming in and brewing at the brew pub for like four or five days straight. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, you know, I had other things to do, but, uh, yeah, I, I brewed quite a, I brewed quite a bit back then. Um, so, and that system was so simple and functional. Um, you know, I kind of miss it. You know, we, even our, uh, pilot system, you know, in our new restaurant, I mean, it's pretty damn sophisticated. Like it's, you know, you, you gotta know how to work a computer to make everything function to some extent. All automated with the, can you control it from your phone? That our, our production plant is like that. It, it was pretty dreamy pretty early on in the, uh, in, in getting that brewery going. It was myself and <clears throat> one of our other brewers who, who still brews with us. And we were bottling, kegging, brewing, dry hopping, everything. So I, I have about a 45 minute commute to the brewery every day and I could just get up in the morning and start milling in or mashing in or doing something. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that was, that was, it, that's still pretty sweet. And uh, we, we can always go back and check on each other too. And, you know, if one of the guys is having a problem with like an, an overnight brew or, or something, we can just kind of get on a phone or an iPad, a computer, whatever, and be like, oh, I see what you're doing. Like you, <laughs> you totally fucked that up. Like, like go figure out how to me because I see it immediately. Or, you know, it, our, our that big brew house is German manufactured. It's a it's a thirty barrel Braucon, and the Germans just will tap into it and run some diagnostics on pumps and stuff. It's it's unbelievable. It, it, it's unbelievable. Gives me great respect for people who brewed on 
you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago <laughs> with like a fire. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, there's um there there's a local brewery here <clears throat> with um the guy started at uh, I think his first brewing job was at Flying Dog. And Flying Dog has a really large system, but it's only semi automated. It's the, like it's not a full like control panel, but there are like you can manually activate celluloid and stuff. And then he went to work at Trogues, hmm. which I, they probably do they send out the are you familiar with Trogues? I don't know how far their reach is, but yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Trogues, I think, is a browcom, so it may be very similar to what it where it's like fully automated you basically load a recipe and click run and it does it and then when he opened his own brewery it was 100 percent manual and he was like some days i just long for <laughs> being able to push a button oh yeah <laughs> for sure for so sure that's a, that's a pretty big uh bump up from seven barrels to 30 barrels Plus, it sounds like so you have the production and then you have a small system at the so you have a production facility and a brew pub. Um, yeah, so we actually moved um, a brew pub to the town uh, square, Jackson Town Square um, in 2019. And we put in a new um, three barrel, five, five barrel system. Um, and it's pretty sweet. It's also encased in glass. And um, I mean, they have to be. Yeah. <laughs> it's a 300 seat restaurant. You just, our executive chef always makes fun of us. Just, you know, I always want to do like an aquarium day because you're just in this like big glass room and have a snorkel and you just look like you're in this giant, you know, you're in the fishbowl. And I, I'm sure a lot of, a lot of brewers can, res you know, feel my, <laughs> the pains of that. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's watching. You so, back. Do um do you use that <laughs> do you use that system for um just feeding beer to the brew pub or is that kind of where you go and play and figure out uh, to do your R and D on? Um, it's it's a little bit of both. Uh, that restaurant's got uh, thirty tap handles, and so we we supply about anywhere at any given time eight to twelve of our mainstays and our cores from the production brewery up to there. Um, there's some weird laws in the state of Wyoming too that actually prevent us from allowing any of the beer we produce in that facility to leave other than in a crowler. Um, so like we can't even transfer kegs from that location to ourselves on our production plant um, and serve them out of that tap room. Um, so everything there is made there and stays there. And, and there's, there's weird stuff in there. We've been brewing some pretty crazy things, some, jalapeno cucumber kolsch that our executive chef really wanted to make we um you know we're, we're part of the hop quality group and the hop research council so we we're constantly working on a bunch of stuff for oregon state university and, and hop trials and experimental varietals and uh, last week i just kegged up a, a new hop that um, as far as i'm aware we're the only brewery right now in the world to have brewed with this hop it, it came out of the idaho um commission, uh, I know hop grower commission plot, experimental plot, and they asked us to brew it because they only got a handful of pounds of it. Um, so we, we do things like that or, uh, or yeah, we, we tweak recipes and methods to figure out how to make a more stable hazy IPA or, you know, is, is, is you know, changing our whirlpool temperatures. And then by the time we, we prove it on that system, we'll, we'll move it over to the bigger brewery and, and try and implement things we learn there. I tell, you know, anyone is welcome to brew up there. And my number one goal is that people learn something, you know, and that could be anyone on our wait staff and they're just learning what, how to brew and what the brewing process is. Or if one of our brewers goes in there, it's like, you're gonna make a hazy IPA. Great. Like let's not do it with oats. Let's try and figure out a different way to bring in some haze. Let's learn something out of it. So, um, we try, we try and make it useful no matter what. And, and we've been pretty good uh, up there. We've, we've only dumped one or two batches and it's honestly because the glycol has failed on us. So we just had like wild fermentations that okay. didn't work. So we, we, we were batting pretty good in there. <laughs> do you like Idaho seven? I do a lot. I hate that hop so much. <laughs> I do like that hop. Um, I've known Nate, the grower of uh, Nate Jackson, the grower of Idaho Seven, for for many, many years now, and 
It took me a while to figure out, and I think one I don't know that it's a garbage hop. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's it. I um, I I kind of gone back on my stance of that because it's I hate whenever it's done as like the the marquee hop or a single hop or something. I don't think it works well by itself, but when it's it's done in a blend, it's way better. Big time. We found it's got to be a really late addition. Dry hop or a cooler yeah. whirlpool. Otherwise, it gets some weird black tea and some other herbal things. But yeah, I'm not. I typically um, <laughs> profess my hatred of of Idaho Seven. <laughs> maybe, maybe not mention the hat to him. Although I'm sure he does not care because there's a lot of people using that hop. <laughs> oh yeah, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable how many people are. Yeah, it's kind of um, like become the new hot thing. Like it was a couple of years ago, it was like, yeah, nobody was using it. Yeah, when it was, it was always listed as like this on, new, right? new experimental hop, Idaho 7. Yeah. Yeah. And I think but, that may have just been the problem is I tried so many on before brewers learned how to use it well. And then, so I just had a lot of bad beers made with it early on. There's no room for bad beer. Fortunately, there's definitely uh, there's definitely some of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Max, how long have you been brewing? Uh, I've been uh, brewing professionally since uh, right around 2012 or so. So, you know, it'd be about actually probably about nine years uh, next month. Or so where, where were you before um roadhouse um like probably like most brewers like in my very beginning i was in my parents kitchen making a huge mess with malt <laughs> <and direct. laughs> um and then uh, my first professional entry into brewing um was another brewery here locally called grand teton brewing which is on the other side of the teton mountain range from jackson uh and victor and driggs idaho which is it's kind of like our bedroom community of Jackson. Um, and so I, I still live over on that side and I brewed there for uh, about five, almost six years or so. Um, and I did a little stint uh, at Siebel as well, um, halfway through my time there. Um, the brewmaster and, and, and mentor of mine, a guy named Rob Mullen, um, I think when he hired me, he had been brewing just about as long as I'd been alive. Um, and he learned from some great guys and uh, learned to brew from some great guys back in the East Coast. And, and he, I told him I wanted to keep learning how to brew. And uh, I think at one point I told him I wanted his job. And, and at one point I got his job. But uh, one of his big things he told me was like, spend some time brewing from him or brewing under him and, and learning from him. And then then take uh, take the next step and go to Siebel, which is one of the best pieces of advice I was, I've ever been given. Uh, was like, learn everything I could and then and then go, you know, take what I'd learned and and continue to grow on that at Siebel. Um, and it was probably about a year and a half after I finished the Siebel program that um, I was approached by Colby and, and Gavin and uh, Jody Valenta, who's our president and, and COO, and, and the three of them. The three of them asked me to come over to check out this brewery they were building. And I remember halfway through, Gavin was like, you know this is a job interview, right? I was like, yeah, I got it. I got, I got it. <laughs> at some point. And um, it was it was really cool. And, and like right out of the gate, the, the passion and, and just what was built already when I started, it was like, yeah, these, these people aren't fucking around right now. Like they're, they're really going big. You know, it's pretty cool to see a 30 barrel brow con sitting in, in a, an industrial park and watch Jackson, Wyoming. And you're like, hmm, don't see that every day. So something <laughs> that'd be pretty cool. There are many reasons why I've chosen district East for where I purchase beer. I love the flexibility of being able to make a custom six pack or take home a crowler from one of the eight beers on tap. The friendly and knowledgeable staff do an amazing job at keeping a diverse selection on hand. You can even purchase artwork from the monthly featured artist. District East is located on Northeast Street in Frederick in the same shopping center as Family Mill and Rockwell Brewery. You can find today's beer lists on the District East Facebook page or at www.districteast.beer. To all you craft breweries, wineries, and distilleries out there, listen up. Atlantic Custom Solutions is the real deal in providing you branded growlers, ceramics, glassware, and accessories like koozies, coasters, and keychains. 
Their high definition digital printing, organic ink, and low fire process ensures your brand is printed in ultra high definition, giving you a one up on the competition. We've used Atlantic Custom Solutions for uncapped branded glassware and couldn't be happier with it. Check them out. Visit www.brandmybeverage.com or give them a call at 434 286 4500 to learn more about how they can help you brand your business. Uncapped is brought to you with support from McClintock Distilling, Maryland's first and only organic certified distillery. They are well known for their award winning gin and are rapidly growing a name for themselves for their matchstick bourbon and boot jack rye whiskey that have both won double gold at international spirits competitions. You can visit them in historic downtown Frederick along Carroll Creek for tours and tastings. Go to McClintockDistilling.com for more information. So, um, uh, another question I always ask people, and I can ask both of you, how did your first uh, homebrew turn out? Max, you first. My first homebrew was absolutely awful. Just an atrocious. <laughs> um, it was a kit. I, it was a, a college girlfriend of mine gave me a homebrew kit at some point in my junior year, probably of college. Um, my, my undergrad degree is in a discipline of biology. So I love, love the science behind it. And I love, I love to cook too, which is like, was ultimately my draw to, to homebrewing. And I was like, well, this can't be, I'm a scientist. <laughs> I cook, like I can do this. <laughs> and I, I remember sitting there, I, I could like walk back to my parents' kitchen in this place where I deliberated with my girlfriend at the time. I was like, I, 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 my first homebrew can't be this kit you got me. Like we should do something simpler. And I don't even remember what it was. It was like a, an American wheat or something. And we brewed it and it was just, it was so bad. I was like, God, this is not going to work. And then like two or three into it, I, but you drank it, but we drank it. We definitely drank it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, two or three into it. They finally got a little bit better. Um, probably was like my third batch of homebrew. It was like a, like an 11% Belgian triple, which was just fantastic. And now that I've been brewing long enough, I, I think I realized it was probably good because it was all the flaws were totally covered up by the esters and the phenols from this just raging Belgian ferment that occurred in my parents' basement. <laughs> so I think it was probably hiding a ton of major flaws, but I still actually have a bottle or two in my house because it's cellared really well. It's such a big beer. So I don't know if I'll ever drink them because it was, you know, it's, it's kind of fun, but yeah. What about you, Colby? Yeah, I mean, I wish I had a better story, but my I went straight for an IPA um, and it got infected and tasted like shit. So, but I drank it anyway. I remember, never forget, like, <laughs> bringing these, um, you know, those, like, Grolsch bottles. Yeah. Oh, like, the little flip tops? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> brought a bunch of those into the office and like I hadn't even tried it yet and I was like oh let's you know let's sit down and drink you know try my home you know my first homebrew or whatever and like first couple sips everybody's you know kind of like pretending like it doesn't taste terrible you know like, <laughs> um and then finally I, I don't know whether it was me or somebody else was just like you know this ain't right you know <laughs> <laughs> Why are you doing this to yeah. us? <laughs> so I got I got better um, pretty quick. I, you know, I, I learned very fast that like sterilization and you know you know just some basic stuff was pretty mission critical. Um, and so you know when you you know if you think about it, like everybody I talked to, I mean, I haven't heard one person honestly that told me that you know the first batch of beer they made was fucking fantastic like i've never I've had a i've had a couple people tell me that and i tell them i don't believe them yeah exactly. unless although like some of them though it was because they were brewing with like their first time brewing was with someone who mm. had been home brewing for a long time so there was someone there to show them the ropes like sure. so i buy that but yeah. like the people would claim that it turned out great the first time like i don't believe them i feel like you're forgetting about your true first time and you know what's funny about it is you you know you think about it like it shouldn't be that hard you know like yeah. you should be able to like you would think that like you just 
you know, fucking Google some basic shit. You know, like, nobody, nobody's walked out of their local homebrew shop with a with a plastic bucket and is like, yeah. "I'm gonna nail this." Like, it actually does. Yeah, you're like, "What am I doing?" Yeah. Well, I think a lot of it is like what you said, the sanitation part of it. Mm -hmm. Like, it, like it, until you mess it up, like you're it. You don't realize that there's clean, and then they're sanitized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and you know it's funny is those rules bend even after you've been brewing for a while. So like, you get away with a little bit. You're like, oh, I didn't, you know, I didn't spend three hours fucking prepping shit this time. I did it in an hour and a half, and I got away with it, and the beer tasted great. So maybe I'll just do that next time. And then you keep pushing the limits, and then all of a sudden, boom, you blow a beer. And you're <laughs> like, fuck, I got to go back to the basics again. You know, like <laughs> the things I've done in a commercial brewery would make most like homebrewers probably like like their skin would just completely roll up on itself yeah <laughs> but, like, now i look i laugh myself i'm like mm -hmm. what if i did this when i was homebrewing i would have like i would have cried myself to sleep like i wasted my whole saturday and like yeah right, 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 right. there's there's too many mistakes i've made or like <laughs> yeah just get in your own head yeah but it's good practice because um, you know, the process of brewing, especially at a home brewer level and following a script and being like methodical about each particular phase of the process. And there's nothing better than kind of getting to the end of the process, getting into a tank, you know, oxygenating it, like sealing everything up and being done and being like, I fucking nailed that. <laughs> like everything went well. You know, my fucking, you know, sparge went great, which is usually where, you know, some shit can get screwed up, like in the homebrew process, like everything went great. And it's like the best feeling in the world. Or you can have one of those days where you are just fucking wrestling that goddamn thing <laughs> the whole time. And by the time you finally sit down in the chair and drink a beer afterwards, you feel like somebody kicked your ass up and down the street. So. What, so. What, was it hard for you guys to scale up when you went from seven barrel to 30 barrel? Um, and actually it seems, sounds like the, you probably, the efficiencies of the systems were probably very different also. Was that a, a, a lot of tinkering you had to do to, or did you just figure like the beer is going to taste what it tastes like at the new place? Or did you try to match to how it was previously? You want to answer from like a yeah. brewery perspective, and I, I have an answer from a business perspective. <laughs> yeah, from, a, from the brewing perspective, I mean, we went from you know like a really beautiful system down at the at the, at the Q, the original brewery, and uh, a different water source, which was a really tough one. You know, we obviously went to some pretty big automation, um, and, and we knew the efficiencies were going to be way different going to you know one of the most premier German brew house manufacturers. Uh, in a 30 barrel system. And I remember, you know, and we're all home brewers at heart too, right? We, we, we've very clearly established that. And so, I, and we, I remember brewing our flagship IPA Wilson uh, as our first turn on the 30 barrel, which was only fitting. And I remember uh, Mikey, who's one of our brewers, he started weighing out a bag of, of some malt. And I was like, I was like, this is, no, uh, this is the first thing I'm going to cut. The whole bag or not the bag? Like, no way are we going to be weighing <laughs> pounds of something to go into a 30 barrel batch. Like, if we want it, the whole bag goes. Like, we're going to thank ourselves later. We're going to thank ourselves at the end of every month when we're trying to reconcile inventory to like the, you know, a tenth yeah. of a pound and something. So, um, it, it, it got easier and we, we worked through some, some hiccups. We, we, grossly underestimated the efficiency of a very modern brew house. And we ended up brewing Wilson, which is about a seven and a half percent IPA. And I think the first batch came out at like 8.8%. Uh, <laughs> like way ever shot our OG. We, we ended up having to dry hop it differently just so we didn't confuse people. And, and I remember we, that was a, a pretty good learning moment for us as well. And um, so it, it, it wasn't, 
awful um, to start. It was a great challenge. It was probably one of the challenges I was most excited about because um, a lot of these recipes were a lot of the recipes Colby had been had been brewing in his his microbrewery in the garage, and it was pretty fun to like see them and, and work through memories of Colby and Colby's friends and family, and be like, "Wow, this this is what I remember of this beer being like." And it was cool to then have a state of the art place to be like, "We can do this." And um, so it, it it took it took a, I'd say ooh, five or six weeks or so to like, and we were doing a couple turns a day, just or a week. I mean, just to try and figure some things out. So. All in all, wasn't wasn't awful. It was a lot of fun, and uh, now we've really got it dialed. Yeah. What's the, what's the business answer? Well, I mean, to add to what Max said, I'll say it would have been a nightmare if you know, he, he weren't the one doing it. Um, that's not just blowing smoke. I mean, if you know, if, yeah, it would have it, 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 it could have been much worse. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, from a business perspective, I'll say, you know, we just speaking personally, we underestimated um, kind of the uh, economies of scale, the thresholds that kind of got us to like break even in profitability um, and how those kind of um, those thre thresholds would kind of move and shift as we um, incorporated new technology or expanded, um, you know, so when we first opened, we were bottling all our products, um, for example, and then we went to bottles and cans, and then we went can only. Um, and each time we made one of those transitions, it kind of changed, um, you know, those inputs kind of changed on in one area and, and the efficiencies, you know, in terms of, you know, how much beer we're getting from bright tank to can and um, from can into package and all of that stuff. And so there was just, we had, it was a very difficult time for us because we had so many variables that were changing at the same time as we were trying to improve our process um, and create a more marketable product to the consumer. Um, so it was hard to know um, exactly what knobs to turn um, in order to kind of find the most efficient spot to be because there were so many knobs being turned at the same time. You know, so, you know, we'd go from you know, brewing into 60 barrel tanks to brewing into 120 barrel tanks. And that started to change um, some of the outputs, you know, um, then that shifted the labor schedule substantially, you know, and we were how many brews we were doing per day. And um, we would be doing that at the same time that we'd be, you know, switching up the, you know, uh, into a can, you know, going from bottles to cans. And, you know, we were doing, uh, I mean, it, it's just, it's been all over the map. And so it's been a very, it's like, you know, nailing jello to a wall um, <laughs> at one point to try to figure out like, okay, if, you know, if A equals B and B equals C, then, you know, here's the profitability point. So we, it just required a tremendous amount of patience. Um, and honestly, I, I wish I could tell you that it took weeks or months, uh, but it's taken us years um, to get to the point where it's like, Okay, we kind of understand um, our costs of goods. We understand our costs of labor. We understand what what products um, have you know produce which margins, um, and you know kind of you know what the what the net margin on the shelf is for a set product and what we should expect. And then when all of that is said and done, what does it take us to actually earn a dollar at the end of the day? Um, as a businessman that had to drive you insane. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I'm guessing in your other business, um, those figuring those things out are probably a lot more cut and dry. Yeah. I mean, certainly more, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Did you? No, that was, that was the end. Yeah. Yeah. So certainly more, um, I had a lot more experience with other businesses. So, um, I think the thing that drove me, crazy during that period of time. Um, well, let me put it this way. The reason I didn't go crazy is because I took the need to know hat off and the hat I put on was, okay, this, we have a long-term goal here of creating great craft beer, um, regionally distributed in the United States. 
um, which to us means, you know, that we want to be a 35 to 50,000 barrel brewery and that will satisfy kind of our regional market. Um, and so, you know, don't get caught up in the small stuff, you know, focus on the end game and, you know, essentially learn from our mistakes, but know that they're going to happen and be okay with it when they do just try not to repeat the same ones. And that was kind of, um, that was the mentality that both Gavin and I and Jody and Max um, all kind of had to adopt. Um, believe me, we you know there have been times where I was at home ripping my hair out, um, <laughs> you know. But now we're at a point where I mean we still have a long way to go. I mean we still we're still learning a lot, um, but we've learned so much. You know the the intelligence that we have at our organization. I. Um, and I want to throw a plug in and say, you know, we're a certified B corporation. You know, a lot of our employees are shareholders. Um, so there, you know, there's a bigger kind of, you know, there, there's more at stake here in kind of what we're doing than just, you know, my interests or Gavin's interests. Um, so anyway, though, you know, I think we try to keep our focus long term. Um, which requires us to be creative financially sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> in a, that that um, that time period and that experience, I think that probably plays a lot into what we were saying earlier about that people who uh, open a brewery just for the money or just as a business without the passion, mm -hmm. that it would make it much harder to go through those times of uncertainty and trying to figure out like the where the target is and everything when you don't have that passion behind what you're doing too and it, where it's just numbers yep yeah i think you die i think you lose your interest in this business quite quickly um <laughs> you know and i think you see that um sometimes i mean you see these breweries pop up and they're um you know, they're kind of driven based on their location. It's like the corner of Maine and Maine and it's a brew pub and, you know, they've got, you know, B plus food and C minus beer. And, you know, it's going to work for about a year until, you know, the customers realize that there's better food and beer somewhere else. And, um, and then the investors are going to be looking at each other and saying, well, if we want this to work, we have to invest in, a good brewer and good equipment and we've got to overhaul our menu and we need a great chef and that's going to cost us a million dollars and that's when the moment of truth comes and it's like fuck this yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Cut our losses. laughs> um though speaking of the beer itself this beer is great the let's see it gets there we go the walrus yeah. the walrus um, cool one, the can's awesome, um, but the, the beer itself is really good. That's what I've been sipping on the whole episode so far. Nice, it's man. Such a good beer. I'm drinking a trout whistle, um, and I would you know, gladly drink somebody else's beer, but um, this is what we have, so. <laughs> does, um, does the walrus have a name? Oh, like the actual walrus himself? Yeah, yeah. Oh. No, I don't, I don't think it does. Well, we've kind of joked around about it, um, you know, because it kind of goes back to, you know, John Lennon, kind of, you know, the walrus is Paul. Like, um, you know, there's also a bunch of fish references in there. Um, it, you know, goes, you know, whatever. There's like two or three different fish references that go in the way. So it's all this stuff. People keep asking me what it is. Um, and here's, I guess what I'll say. It's no one person, it's an ideal. Um, so have there been times that it's been Max? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but he has to earn that every day. <laughs> so does, uh, so Max grunts, growls, and barks? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Some days, you never know. <laughs> He's a, it's a very dignified looking walrus. It is. The monocle really sets him apart. <laughs> and, and the pipe. I mean, it's the not, pipe. 
it's not every day you see well in, in anyone let alone a walrus be uh, smoking a pipe and blowing such perfect smoke rings yeah. out of the pipe i mean yeah. that's some control <laughs> we have uh we had an artist draw the walrus on the way to the bathroom in our restaurant and she did some freelance work and stuffed his pipe with just a bunch of like bright green. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I saw um, that fish is a big part of your story. Uh, it's part of the Venn diagram of mm -hmm. uh, the starting. So I'm assuming uh, you and uh, are, are, is it you that's the fish fan or? Uh, everyone you know it's it so it actually gets so when roadhouse was started it was um adam chenault and i were both massive fish fans um and continue to be to this day um and then an assistant kind of brewer came on board named neil albert um who was with us for a long time he ended up going into sales and um, he's no longer with Roadhouse, although he's still a great friend. Um, and then it kind of trickled down to there. We've got a, we've got a brewer at Roadhouse, uh, Mike, who's, you know, a huge fish fan. And, and then, you know, so they come, they've come out of the woodwork over the years. It's this <laughs> common thread of, um, but it all originally started with, um, Adam and I being fish fans and, um, yeah. And then, and that just influenced a lot of, um, like I kind of geek out on some of the branding around our beers and I get a lot of inspiration, um, from fish because I listen to a lot of fish when I'm thinking about branding and what I want to, you know, put on the next beer, whatever's coming. And, but I also get a lot of inspiration from, you know, there's, I've weaved a few other, a lot of other groups into our product over the years from you know, Pink Floyd to Led Zeppelin to uh, Rage Against the Machine, uh, Nirvana, you know, you can tell when I was born, so. <laughs> I, uh, my wife's a teacher um, and she was walking past one of her students at they had a Nirvana lyric written on her notebook and she was, and she was like, oh, uh, Kurt Cobain. And she's like, you know about Nirvana? And my wife was like, yeah, I listened to him when he was alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah so, uh, my wife and I, our first dance was to Waste at our wedding. Oh, sweet. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Um, yeah, I mean, it's funny. Like, I've done a lot. I, I, go, I go to fish concerts a lot of times by myself. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but I, you know, I, I'll, I'll do like a three day fish run in like Indiana. Like I'm doing it this summer, like by myself and I'll just go and I won't tell anybody I'm going. I don't want to meet up with any friends. I don't want to, I just want to go kind of like get into some like zone time. And it's like a, this amazing experience for me to just kind of tap into my creativity and like, um, you know, I can sit there and I come up with a million ideas about what I want to do next in business, what I want to do next at the brewery, what products I want to, you know, like what, what's the next label look like on the next, you know, and then, you know, why, am why am I such a shitty father? I mean, you know, like <laughs> whatever you want to, you know, and, and then after three I have that days, same I, thought often too, it happens <laughs> often right after my daughter has told me I'm the worst father. Yeah. <laughs> When she's going on one of her five-year-old rants because I wouldn't let her have like a piece of candy or something. <laughs> They're rough, man. <laughs> They're rough. So anyway, it's just become this kind of uh, like mini, you know, rite of passage every once in a while that I try to throw into my life. And that's why it ends up being on a bunch of our stuff. Um, so. you've, you've mentioned branding a few times now. Um, I, I really like, uh, the, your branding. It's very clean, uh, uncluttered. And like, that's my favorite type of like, I'm an, I'm an Apple fan. Mm -hmm. Um, so I like clean, crisp designs and 
through it. And uh, so where did the logo come from? Is it just because there's bears everywhere in Wyoming? And I know nothing um, about Wyoming, so that's what I just assume. Yeah. <laughs> we do have a lot of bears. We do, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, we just, we wanted, you know, want something that was kind of, you know, brought you to this place. So it was, you know, ever present, you know, kind of, you know, a Wyoming thing, the grizzly bear, uh, especially Yellowstone and surrounding area. Um, and we, but we also wanted something that was, you know, very strong and regal. Um, and so um, we flirted around with a couple of different ideas and the grizzly bear just kind of resonated um, over and over again. So yeah, that, that was kind of, uh, but we also knew, you know, we have, we have two logos, I guess. We have the bear, the bear that we use, and then we kind of have the just our initials. Yeah. Um, and we interchange them and play around with them and do different things with them um, so that, you know, the cu customer over time starts to associate, you know, both with the brewery. Um, and it gives us a lot of freedom and flexibility to play around with it. Um, so I like that. And the way the, the bears uh, drawn or done with clean lines and stuff, it, it like as I'm scrolling through like your Instagram, it's perfect on everything it's put on. Mm. Like the, that the gray and red hat that is beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it's sweet. Um, are you talking about like the felt kind of one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it actually comes out quite well, surprisingly, because there's some detail. Um, but yeah, I mean, people love the, the bear. I mean, you know, we put it and people love Jackson Hole. I mean, I don't have the exact numbers, but I can tell you we sell three times as many t-shirts at our pub if they say Jackson Hole on them as ones that don't. Huh, that's interesting. I guess it's like, um, is it a big tourist area? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that, that probably plays into it. Like, I like this shirt. I really wanted to say I was in Jackson Hole. 100%. Because there was this amazing movie or TV show that mentioned it that someday. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're going to figure out. It's going to come to us at some point here. I don't know. I've been thinking about it for weeks now, and I can't remember or figure it out. So it's definitely not going to be me that it comes to. Yeah. Um, I'll get it as soon as we hang up. You know, there was, uh, I, I, so Coley Briz mentioned this, but I was out of work for about a week or so. I had a total fluke accident in the brewery, but I, I watched a ton of movies on Amazon Prime, and I'm now realizing in one of the opening scenes of I Love You Man with Paul Rudd and Jason Segel, when Paul Rudd is trying to sell Lou Ferrigno's home, Jason Segel's like, why is Lou, uh, why is Lou selling this place? And Paul Rudd's, he bought a house in Jackson Hole. That's it. That is it. <laughs> That is amazing. That is that is absolutely wow. because it was just kind of like a throwaway. Call. That that is definitely it because I love that movie. Oh, you got this. It's, it's a great. It's a great movie. It's a great little moment. It is more time in Jackson Hole. Oh. Yes, <laughs> that is that is one hundred percent what I was trying to remember. I'm making a note to myself to watch. Uh, I love you, man. It's a great movie. It's a great, great movie. It's going to be in the show notes. <laughs> but yeah, it's a it's a heavy tourist. I mean, it, we're you, it's 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 dangerous to try and drive your car down uh, through main you know the main square here in Jackson. And you're, you're always playing tourist Frogger, and our restaurant opens at <laughs> thirty, and it's it's almost fully seated within fifteen minutes of of us opening the doors. You know, we'll be finishing up service talk down there and you can just hear people. It's, it's 1131 and you can just hear someone on the door. Like, <laughs> Why aren't you open? It's like, here we go. Give me a second. <laughs> yeah. um, so I, that's, um, I've always wondered, so places that are huge touristy areas, do you love the tourists or you hate them? That is a great question. Um, <laughs> and the answer is we love them. Um, and, uh, sometimes I have to grit my teeth and say it, um, <laughs> but, uh, those people put food on our table. Yeah. They make it, they make what you're doing possible. They pay our bills. 
They pay a, a special tax here in Jackson, one penny for every dollar. 70% of it's funded by tourist dollars, um, goes to support um, essentially a pool of money that we all get to vote on on how it's allocated. It goes to hospitals, it goes to schools, it goes to- Oh, that's really cool. Is that yeah. Wyoming as a whole or that's a local- That's a Teton thing? County thing. Okay. Yeah, we are. Um, and I'm not sure if other Wyoming counties have it, but they might. Um, but my answer is that, you know, I grew up in a tourist town. I grew up in Lewis, Rehoboth Beach, Delaware was a tourist yeah. town. I remember people used to have bumper stickers that, you know, were basically like, you know, lo you know locals rule and shit like that. And, you know, and I, I always found that my grandfather told me, you know, one time he owned a grocery store. He's like, you know, essentially, you know, don't ever complain about a farmer with your mouth full. Um, and, <laughs> And, uh, you know, what he was saying was, you know, essentially the tourism business has supported this family for a long time. So, you know, you need to appreciate it. So, it, you know, it drives me crazy sometimes when I'm driving around and somebody stopped in the middle of the road and it's like, where the, you know, you can't drive like that anywhere. What makes you think you can drive like that? Anywhere? Um, but that's my answer, Max. What do you? No, I, I'd say the same thing. We get to make beer in Jackson Hole and we get to play, you know, Colby mentioning why he ended up in Jackson. We're, we're all here for the same reason. We'd love to be outside. We love to live the lifestyle we do here in, in the Tetons and ski, fish, raft, paraglide, hike, climb. Yeah, so it's probably year round tourism too, right? It is up until probably, honestly, the early onset of, of COVID related things. We, we had very distinct shoulder seasons, um, mud seasons as we call it. And you couldn't, you couldn't get a, you can, dine in in a restaurant if you wanted because the restaurant's just closed. It didn't even make sense. And that usually was dictated around the ski resort, Jacksonville Mountain Resort. <clears throat> so you know, kind of right in the, the, the fall when kids are back in school up until about Thanksgiving and then uh, when the mountain closes, which is about early April or so. Um, and then it was just a ghost town. And, and all of these folks who make their living in the service industry, which is a vast majority of, of folks here in, in Jackson, uh, they'd go down to the desert, they go down to Moab, they might go home back to the East Coast, West Coast, wherever, um, you know, and, and town would shut down. But now it's, our, we just put our, we just had one of our biggest months ever at the production brewery back in April, which normally we use to shut down and, you know, take apart chain conveyors in the brew house and take apart the bottling line, can line, whatever we were running to make sure it was running correctly. And we haven't been able to turn anything off. We've just been rolling. So, um, and that, that might change next year. We'll see. It might just be people are psyched that they can get out of their house and are coming to see us here in Jackson. So, um, yeah, it's pretty full on year round. So as an area that was so dependent on, uh, tourism, how did COVID hurt your operations? Um, it, or was there enough like people getting to go cans that it 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 kept you a, a, in a in a safe place? Yeah, our, our canning our canning went through the roof, right? Because and now a lot of it was the draft just got funneled into cans. Yeah. And draft the draft world was you know was not was non existent for quite some time there. Um, our restaurant we you know we closed our restaurant uh, pretty early on. We were probably I think the first uh, kind of business to just kind of make a stance with it and just shut down um, before anything kind of got mandated by the state or the county here. Um, so that was, a little, that was a little spooky, a little scary for sure, tense. Um, and then we pivoted and adapted and did, you know, I'd, I'd say we did very well through the pandemic. I think a lot of that comes down to the team and everyone involved in, in the brewery you know, sourcing cans, which is just a nightmare still in the, in the craft industry. But we, you know, our everyone was calling it all everyone we could and tapping into connections working hard long days just to fill orders and get beer out of out of the brewery um so all in all i mean we're, we're it, we did i'd say pretty well through through all of covid and uh and i recognize we're quite fortunate in that and i know a lot, not a lot of breweries also you know did as well as we did but i don't think you know it, it didn't happen just out of coincidence or luck. You know, we, we had a team that really just showed up every day and kicked ass to make it happen. Yeah. I have to add that the state of Wyoming did an absolutely, absolutely amazing job 
supporting local businesses in Wyoming. Um, so the CARES Act, um, just, you know, by way of background a little bit, you know, um, gave money to each state um, that they could kind of spend discretionary money, you know, however they wanted. Well, the minimum that went to each state was 1.25 billion. So, you know, Wyoming with 500,000 people got 1.25 billion and Montana with a million people got the same amount of money. So basically per capita, we got a lot more money than just about any other state in the country. Yeah. Um, the Wyoming legislature got together and said, you know, we've got essentially more money than we could really spend. What do you want to do? between the governor and the legislature, they set up two different funding programs that essentially got money into small business hands um, to repair their gap in revenue or losses that they had suffered over the course of, you know, different periods of time during COVID. And that money came into the brewery, direct dollars, and allowed us to keep our people paid. It allowed us to pay our rent. Um, and it was above and beyond, like it was above and beyond the PPP stuff, which was kind of worthless. And, yeah. you know, this was like, this was real money. Um, so, and they did it pretty quick. So that was awesome. huge. Yeah. That was huge for Wyoming and for us as a brewery. Yeah. That, that's definitely awesome that they well, one that they had the foresight to like come up with an actual plan that was very beneficial to the, the populace and then acted quickly to, to do it. Um, but I would, I would imagine too that shift from a seven barrel brewery to a 30 barrel production place that, um, distribution weighed heavily into that business model. So that probably also set you up in a good place where you had years of building that distribution network to also send beer out into the world. Yeah, we were pretty fortunate um, in that we had started moving into states like Colorado, Utah, um, you know, Montana, um, Idaho, you know, years, you know, it's years prior to the pandemic. So we had, you know, we had established salespeople, we had established accounts, we had growing, you know, on-premise uh, and off-premise sales. And so when we lost the on-premise and everybody started raiding liquor stores, you know, we saw kind of um, the benefit of, of that. And, uh, you know, I think if we had been younger in that process, if we had been moving into new markets um, going into the pandemic, we would have suffered much more. It would have been harder. Um, I mean, look, you know, it's, it's really nice to be good but sometimes it's nice to be lucky so yeah yeah he never, never frowned upon luck. <laughs> yeah i think it helped too you know in the same vein of, of being in these states and established we you know people knew our product and, and it you know some of our beers became staples for people well before the pandemic and i think at a time when people were also pretty hesitant to take a chance on what they wanted to buy in a grocery store or a liquor store maybe you know yeah i've got ten dollars in my pocket no problem nothing's going on in the world sure i'll try brewery a b and c's ipa over the course yeah. of the week and we we heard it from a bunch of people so i know it's i know i'm sure there's more people who felt the same but some of our flagship beers people just knew they could turn to and grab a six pack of it and they knew exactly what they were getting and just would go back time and time again and we saw it out of our tap room too we were selling cases of beer and we'd have our locals usually would belly up in our tap room and have a pint or two of our IPA and they were coming in buying a case and they were like, you know, we're, uh, this, this will be good. We'll see you guys in about a week or so. And sure enough, they'd come back like two days later and they were like, yeah, I, I drank a case of your IPA in two days. We're like, yeah, you did. All right. Dude. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was, a one of the larger distributors, distributors in this area said that, um, familiar, uh, mainstays were doing well. Like it was the familiar comfort that people were going after and just picking up that like they knew they liked it. They didn't want to think about like add another thing to have to figure out and think about and just grab what they knew was going to be good. So when um, when you decided to go from the brew pub to production and the new brew pub was a big part of that. It I, I assume you had some 
capacity uh, issues. So was it to because you, were, you couldn't make enough beer, but then also that you had this plan for a large expansion? Yeah, it was, um, we couldn't make enough beer and we couldn't make any money. Um, so we basically got to a point really quickly within the first uh, 18 months, we realized that we could not make enough beer on a system that size without having, you know, and the room we had with fermentation and everything else, we were limited and we couldn't expand. We couldn't without blowing out a wall or doing something which was going to cost a fortune. It was just like, essentially what we realized is mechanically, the way that we set this thing up from the beginning, it was doomed to fail. It will never work. Um, so if we're okay with losing money every year on this, <laughs> then it's fine. Let's just keep it going. Um, but, and it was, cause it wasn't a lot of money we were losing. It was just some, you know? Um, but if we want to actually make money, we have to change. And if we want to actually, you know, put beer in people's hands outside of our own restaurant, then we have to do something differently as well. So that was really the basis. So it was like, okay, well, we're going to do something different then we have to do one of two things. We either have to expand in our existing space or we have to find a new one. And we basically started going down both roads at the same time. When, um, when you built a new place, did you go all in at that time, get a canning line and everything or, Oh, you said you were bottling at first, right? Correct. Yeah. We, yeah, we went all in, we did it all at once. We, got um you know reverse osmosis filtration um you know what we thought was going to be fermentation space for us for a while um that lasted <laughs> what six months yeah um we uh had a full bottling line really nice livinger um bottling line um centrifuge fully automated centrifuge centrifuge we got an automated cip skid for dosing our caustic and acids and also recapturing those uh augering system yeah everything grain for silos the whole deal <laughs> so what it, it was an attractive brewery to go work for when you had your show around it, interview it was incredible <laughs> it was i blew my mind i mean it you know, and like, you know, I think brewery floors, you know, as someone who's now brewed and brewery, a lot of different breweries and spent, you know, we have one of the nicest floors ever. It's like one of the beautiful <laughs> cascade red floors, you know, and you, it, it, you, you scrub it and it comes clean. I mean, it's everything about it was like, holy shit. We've got fooders. We've got a big barrel program. I mean, I it was like a bright red floor. I just found a photo of it. Yeah, yeah, quite, <laughs> quite bright. And there's like a couple spots that are that are not. You know, we left a couple that were just concrete, just polished, finished concrete, and we were like, ah, that's gonna be our staging area someday. And I was like, no, like here, or it's going to be our staging. It's never. It's always just been production floor. Um, so yeah, it was a very attractive brewery to walk into. I definitely picked my job the floor a couple of times. Of like, holy shit, you've got this and that and i mean it's yeah it's 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 really really an impressive brewery i mean it's it's super, super proud to, to go up there every day and show it off to people when they're in town and it, it's unbelievable but to be fair you know max walked away from a very established brewery with established distribution and sales as the head brewer just got promoted um, the brew master, yeah, the brew master, um, for, an, you know, so he, he took some risk. Yeah, definitely. I remember, I mean, I told Cole, I remember telling Colby though, like saw it all, you know, had a good idea, you know, cause I, like every brewer, I wanted to start my own brewery and started, you know, started talking with Roadhouse and saw this and I was like, wow, this is incredible. Like absolutely a dream for a brewer to see. And we went, we kind of went back and forth and I, I kind of waffled a couple of times and, you know, I had to commute and I had, to, you know, I had, to, I had left that very, very cushy, stable role. 
And I remember telling Colby that straight out. I was like, you know, man, like one of my biggest holdups is I'm afraid I'm going to fail. And I think Colby even said to me, he was like, he's like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't consider you to run our brewery if you weren't afraid. And that was reassuring. And I was like, all right, let's do it. Let's roll. And uh, yeah, it's been great. Yeah. Fear of failures worked well for me. <laughs> Anyway, I would think too, like going through there and seeing how all in they were going, like you had to think like they're dedicated to this. Um, the only way this is going south is if it crashes and burns spectacularly. Big time, big time, you know, and, and Colby and, and Gavin are, are, you know, both very good at what they do other than Roadhouse. And I didn't really know Colby coming into it. I, I didn't really know Gavin either, but I knew of Gavin because he owns restaurants, which are very public things. And just knowing that I was going to work for two people and then getting to know Jody as well. So we'll call it three people that, you know, would <laughs> would go down with the ship until like they were too far with it. You know, like there was no way this was, <laughs> there was no way this was gonna stop or fail or it was uh, it's it's been a really killer ride. Definitely have had to grow up a lot really fast. It's been a exponential <laughs> <laughs> growth and development for for myself and, and I know a lot of other folks who work with us as well. So um, Colby, we should say congratulations that semi-recently you were added to the board of directors for the Brewers Association. Yep, correct. Um, yeah, that was cool. Kind of a, kind of a surprise, really. Um, not a surprise in the sense that I applied for it, but a surprise because it there the position only became available because Joe Biden got elected and one of the board members stepped away to be part of his administration. Oh, did you fill um, Julie's spot? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, who I don't know, but I'm happy to take her seat. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Julie is an amazing person. Okay. Uh, she's She's been a guest a couple times. Sweet. Uh, her brewery is probably 40 minutes from where I live. But uh, great, great person. That's a cool connection. I, did, I didn't know that. I yeah, had, I, I had for completely forgotten about how she was on the board and would have had to, whenever she was appointed to something with small businesses. Correct, yeah. Small business, business uh, whatever that part is. Uh, she was appointed to that and I guess had to step away from the brewing world for a little bit. Um, she's been great and instrumental in helping with getting, uh, Maryland used to have some really screwy laws that pertain to breweries. She was very active in getting a lot of that changed a few years ago. Um, so yeah, how how does that process work? Like, so you apply, and then do the members vote on who's who's elected to it? Or yeah, you know, I to be I, I wish I had a better answer for you. I don't really know. <laughs> um, the I I was contacted. I think I was nominated because I had applied for the position in the past, and because a couple of the board members um, I know and and well and I'll. Yeah, so somebody, uh, I know who it was, but I'm going to not embarrass him, nominated me. And, um, and then I got a phone call um, that essentially said, you've been nominated along with, uh, you know, three or four other people. And uh, so you need to submit, you know, answers to these questions and do a video thing and, you know, have it all in in three days. This is what the BA does fucking every time. It, it drives me crazy. <laughs> It's like, you know, we need all of this information from you in 48 hours. Um, so, so I was in Mexico. I was with, took my family down to Mexico. So I just like took my phone out, did like a one minute, hey, I'm Colby Cox, you know, Roadhouse Brewing Company, blah, 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 blah. Sent it in, sent in the answers thinking this, you know, probably isn't going to happen because I, didn't really put much effort in. And then two weeks later, I got a phone call saying you've been elected. So I don't know who elected me, whether it was the board or what. 
Well, someone did, and congratulations. Yeah, so I have my first <laughs> board meeting coming up, um, which will be very fascinating given um, some of the recent events in, in the craft beer world. Yes. So we are, uh, we are gonna spend some time talking about that. You're a member at large, is that right? Or is it, what's your role on the board? Um, again, great question. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's member at large, right? Or, right. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah, because I think that's what Julie was. Yeah, member at large. I think I'm a me I'm a member um, as both a brew pub owner and a production brewery owner. But okay. I I don't know which. Yeah. Which one got you on? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will find all this out when I get there. Um, and I don't get me wrong. Um, my lack of information right now has nothing to do with my lack of interest or motivation to you know, support and provide as much um, positive impact on the Brewers Association as I can. Um, but this all happened very recently. And so. Oh, and, and life's been a little crazy for the past year. <laughs> yeah, it's been a little crazy. Um, and it just got crazier. I mean, you know, like, you know, not to bring it up again, but I mean, to, to get just right on the heels of COVID and then all of a sudden having, you know, a complete flare up in the industry of, you know, issues, you know, related to sexual harassment and things like that, that are, you know, now kind of the epicenter, the focus of what's going on is just, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's been a trying time for craft beer. Yeah, that is, um, I, I, I was going to reach out and do an episode, um, but I decided I wanted to wait a little while because mm -hmm. uh, one, I didn't want to add another thing for <clears throat> any of the people heavily involved in to worry about or even bother them with it now. And I kind of felt like it was also, like it would be better to have that conversation once things die down a little bit, that in the heat of everything may not be the best time like waiting till it the the initial reaction dies down have those conversations to kind of keep it moving it forward instead of just piling on because i mean everyone's writing articles and mm. reaching out for interviews and stuff now I, I felt like waiting would be a better approach yeah you know i commend you for that um i think that's kind of been, uh, ro you know, Roadhouse's attitude towards all of this has been a little bit like, um, you know, we have a female CEO, we have, you know, female heads of most of our departments with the exception really of Max. Um, we don't really feel like um, it's in, we're in a good position to, to comment one way or the other so we've kind of opted to not say anything we felt a little awkward in that at the same time because you know it's in today's world sometimes it feels like by not saying something people are saying that you're saying something yeah um and so we kind of feel a little bit and i think a lot of breweries do feel a little stuck between a rock and a hard place um so we're adopting a similar mentality, which is we're going to kind of wait and see uh, what's going on and try to get as many facts as we can and make an assessment. And, you know, uh, but I got pl I'll get, you know, plenty educated on, you know, I honestly I don't know any of the, you know, of the story I haven't of the stories that are out there that are um, creating a lot of headlines. You know, I can't really claim to be extremely educated on the facts. Um, and so um, I will get a lot more facts, I believe, when I'm in, you know, meeting with the BA and a lot of education, because I think we're going to be doing a lot of training on um, equity, d diversity and inclusion. Yeah. Um, so and a, and a sad part of it is too, like the focus is on craft beer right now, but it's really not that different in a lot of other industries. Not at all. Like it, it's a it's a problem that needs to be fixed uh, in, a, in a much larger sense, 
but it's good that especially from reading some of the atrocities that have happened in some of these breweries it is it's a very good thing that these stories have come to light and some of those um the worst offenders have been ousted out of the the industry at this point so at least has been positive change in sure. some, some instances now i also think it's you know it's easy in in situations like this to make these broad assertions that you know let's say you know because of these incidents you know this entire industry must be wrought with this issue and this entire industry needs a complete overhaul and i just don't believe that yeah and and i mean and then you would have to say like the entire world because yeah. like i said it, it happens in every industry and there are plenty of breweries where like that doesn't happen um, 100 and it's 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 a shame that sometimes that the atrocities of a few kind of get attributed to everywhere where but i think in a in a way it is good that again it, it draws enough attention that because some some of these people they weren't they wouldn't have stepped away from their breweries without this happening like if mm -hmm. If there wasn't such a spotlight, they would still be doing what they've been doing for sometimes a decade uh, without a reckoning time. Yeah, but yeah, it's it's. I think it's a big problem, but I don't think it's like a every brewery has this issue. Yeah, I I, you know. I, I do not like words like systematic. Yeah. Um, you know, that we have as an industry, you know, there's a lot of stuff people are putting out there right now. It's like, as an industry, we need to, it's like, hold on a second. You know, I know how we're running our brewery and I'll hold that up to whatever fucking magnifying lens you want to, you know? And, um, I don't need roadhouse doesn't need anything from you. You know, and there are a lot of breweries out there that are doing the right thing. So, you know, if and and frankly, I think oftentimes it's the people screaming the loudest about I'm sorry and change needs to happen in the industry that are the ones that need to point the fucking finger at themselves. Oh, I've seen statements made by some breweries that definitely should swing around and look in a mirror. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I mean I you know people could listen to this podcast and they could, you know, take whatever exception to my comments they would like. But, um, you know, I, I stand strongly behind Roadhouse and what we've done and, and I'm proud to serve on the board and I will serve at the board's discretion. Um, but I think there's a lot of breweries out there doing the right thing. And I think there's a few breweries out there that are giving those breweries a bad name. Yeah. And I, I've, and I think I think that's a natural response to feel like to when if when you are running a brewery and you've gone out of your way and not even out of the I mean it's I don't think that's the right way to say it like where you're just good people <laughs> it, like you should, it's not really going out of your way to be a good person but yeah. you've like you've done the right things you treat people with respect and you're just a good person like you it's it's hard to not feel attacked when everyone is just lumping everyone together. Yeah. And especially when he, when he add in, like some people are saying silence is just as bad, but then there's also the message that as a man, you shouldn't be talking right now. You should be listening. So it's like, you're, it, it's, it's, if you are doing the right thing, it's kind of hard to know what you should be doing right now. Yeah. Other than just keep doing the right doing thing. what you're doing. I mean, if you're doing the right thing, just keep doing what you're doing. That's you like know. the only thing I've said previously was as a man, it's really it's a really easy thing to approach. One, don't sexually harass or abuse women. Or two, if you see it, stop it. Like as a man, those are really the only two things you have to do. Like just don't do it. And if you happen to see someone doing it, stop it. Yeah. Um, I think it's, uh, 
well, let's just say this. I, I think there will be, I will have more to say about this topic um, as things continue. So I'm following it closely. Yeah, I would, I would assume that the, that's going to be a very, very uh, high up uh, tick mark for what the Brewers Association wants. And rightfully so. It should be something to, to make sure that they're paying attention to. Yeah, they hold themselves to a high standard. I've, I've seen it already. I mean, they, you know, they want to take a leading role on this topic. Um, so. So how um, how long is the term for when you're on? Because it's it's a mm -hmm. term limit, right? Yeah, I think uh, because I'm stepping into somebody else's shoes, I think I have like 22 months. Okay. So, uh, and then I think I can be reelected. Um, I just don't know um, for how many terms, like, you know, whether it's one additional term or what, but I, yeah. So another question I had was what um, what are the trends in craft beer in Wyoming? Do they follow the coasts or, I mean, I guess actually in the middle of the country, a lot of the trends are the same where it's all hazy IPAs and sour, heavily fruited sours, or is it more, because it seems like you're much more in a traditional styles brewery. Is that the that just the stance you like where you fit because even around here there are like very successful breweries that they they'll occasionally brew uh your more hype beers but do a great job just producing clat like classical styles or more traditional um or is that just not really popular in that area I would say that, um, you know, coming full circle back to tourist uh, based town here, we see, we see everyone from everywhere. So we can at our brew pub brew the most ridiculous thing ever. And someone's going to love it because it's a ridiculously hyped up thing. Or, you know, we, we made a beer where I bought, like 30 pounds of watermelon sour patch kids and just jumped on that train for a hot second. It was like one of the fastest beers we've sold out of, you know, like uh -huh. we, it was gone watermelon sour with sour patch kids. Um, but at the same time, we've got a really beautiful whole flower, very traditional Hellas on tap. And there's a place for that as well. Um, so I think we're, it's a Jackson is an enigma in the state of Wyoming because we have all those tourists and there's very adventurous people, people who are down to drink a guava IPA that's radiating pink. And, um, but frankly, if you get anywhere outside of the town of Jackson, you're, you're getting pretty Bud Light, Coors Light, heavy country. Um, and that's been a big mission for us as a company is to try and you know continue to educate the state of Wyoming in the consumer base here that, you know, I, I believe I drink a lot of yellow beer. I very open about that. I love crushing Miller Lite in the summer. I drink a lot of Coors Banquet, um, but there's more to it than just those beers. Um, it's not wrong if that's the only beer you think, but you know we do stick to some pretty traditional styles of beer. Family vacation. Um, it's, it's gone through a couple of identity crises. It was a blonde ale, it was a cream ale. Um, we've kind of retooled it to be a golden ale, and that's a really popular beer for us in the state. It's a very approachable, very light, easy gateway five percent beer that might bring someone in a small town in Wyoming, you know, into our life as Roadhouse because they were able to try this beer and it, you know, it resonated with them. And we make a very traditional Pilsner too, that highway man. And that does it for us as well. We, you know, I, I love to challenge people who sit down at our, at our bar and say, give me a Bud Light. And it's like, how would I give you this? And if you don't like it, you know, I'll buy you your Bud Light. And most of the time people are, are really psyched to try something different, pretty stylistically classic. Um, I don't think we're against hype and gimmick and that kind of stuff, but I think we all, you know, something I'm really proud of is that we brew at the, at the big brewery at our, you know, the production facility, the beer we brew there is the beer that we all genuinely like to drink. And I think we all love the expression of big, bold hops, our commitment to the hop 
community is pretty high too, as I mentioned, being in the Hop Quality Group and the Hop Research Council and the, the connections we have with the hop growers. So we, we make really big, bold, hoppy beers, but they're all balanced. Um, Walrus is fruited. You know, our double hazy double IPA it does have some tangerine and peach puree into it, but not enough that if we if you left it sit outside, uh, the can might explode. You know, we we ferment it out and we use the salt and pepper to give a little accent to that beer. So um, it's it's yeah. also subtle. Um, yeah, very. Like, I like I could tell there was something there, but I couldn't actually discern it until I read it, and then I was like, oh yeah, I definitely taste that. So it, it's a nice subtle flavor addition to it definitely definitely we we definitely go for balance you know we want people to buy a six pack and and really enjoy drinking through that six pack you know maybe in a night it's one of our lower alcohol beers you know and someone crushes a six pack of our four percent pilsner like that's that's a win for us you know we want that balance we want we want people to come back to it because i can't tell how many times i've had a big gimmick typed up style of beer and i'm just like Oh, like I couldn't drink a whole yeah pint of that. Make it like halfway through it. Yeah, it's it's really cool, but you know that's that's not necessarily what we are all about. Um, at least when it comes to canning the beers, we we do. Breath and bramble sounds really good though. The, ras the raspberry and lemon sour. Yeah, that Ooh. is um, that's that's gonna be a really fun one coming up here uh, real soon. Who um who does the uh, pairs with suggestions? So like how you have that listed for all your beers. Nice. <laughs> yeah, so I write I write the copy. Um, so I write these that kind of in, info on the side, and then the beer description. Um, I kind of yeah, I I enjoy that. So, um, I like it when we when we create a new beer because then I get to do some new stuff. What does the Outcasty beer do? What does it do? Yeah, because it it's um, like the notes, the 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 um, walrus. It says this beer growls, knocks, grunts, and barks. Ah. Mm. What what are the notes for Outcasty? <sighs> I can't remember what they are. Yeah, that was not a fair question because you have a lot of beer. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it's a I, and sloths are cool, so I just thought it probably it probably has a cool thing on it. Yeah, that's a pretty uh, that's a pretty fun beer. We let that one rest this year. Um, yeah, we literally my hands and a lot of our staff's hands turn orange from all the sweet potatoes that we. <laughs> um, we literally ordered a pallet of sweet potatoes. Like two thousand pounds from uh, like you know uh, an equivalent of like Cisco or U.S. Foods, yeah. And she's uh, peeled and roasted and mashed, and it was intense. Um, yeah, I think the cop. I think the notes, if I have this right, on Alcasti says it may lead to spending nights in bars, glasses tinkling. <laughs> Um, so, whoops, where am I here? Um, yeah, so that's another, you know, yet another fish reference. <laughs> when, um, how long, how long ago did you get into doing seltzers also? Um, we've only canned maybe two or three runs of it. Um, so it was only this, this spring really. Okay. Um, yeah, that was, uh, we started brewing those first test batches of our hard seltzer up at the brew pub, um, maybe about 18 months ago. Um, Colby and Gavin, myself, um, Jody, our, our director of marketing, Molly, the, the six of us or five of us sat downstairs. We've got this pretty cool eclectic cellar in the basement of the, the the brewery that's got like neon lights and black lights and really rare beer and we do our best thinking down there and, and we all came to the table with a every seltzer we could buy in jackson and we started drinking through them and and we we all kind of went back and forth like like you know like, fuck yeah this is something we're gonna do and then there was days where it's like 
fuck no, we're not going to do this. Like, <laughs> absolutely not. And then finally, we we decided we were going to do it, and um, it was every hard. Time, every time I hear a brewery like want to take the moral stance of not making seltzer, I just ask them if they like money. I hundred yes. <laughs> <laughs> percent. Um, it was one of the hardest things I've or definitely done. Do you feel like being asked for the next? Yeah. Two, three, four years why you don't make a seltzer by every yeah. person you bump up in against on the street. I mean, it's yeah. like... Which then can be followed up with why don't you like money? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, no, it was a hard one for us um, because we, you know, definitely consider ourselves beer geeks and, um, you know, this wasn't a beer geek product you know, in my eyes. So I was probably one of the ones that was more opposed to it than probably anybody. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but do you like money? But I like money. <laughs> um, I especially like getting money back um, <laughs> that we've spent. And so, um, no, I also, we wanted to do it um, under the Roadhouse name, but we wanted to give it its own look, its own brand, um, so that it was separate and distinct, so that people didn't just look at it like a Roadhouse malt beverage product. You know, they they saw it as you know a different category, and you know, but I think we did a good job. I think you know, I think the I think Mac, I think the product itself is pretty good. I'm not a huge seltzer drinker, but when I have one. Uh, I, I like the flavors to be a little more subtle and a little less like in your face. And I think this, this, you know, Celsius does that. So, well, and I think they're nice from the standpoint of like, there are a lot of beer geeks that have friends or significant others that do not like beer. So now, or can't drink beer for any number of reasons and they drink seltzers. So there's. Yep. That now friends and significant others are more willing to go to a brewery to and have something to drink. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I'll, I'll do brewery tours and inevitably, um, inevitably the, you know, the, let's say 10 people, you know, seven of them will all be like, yeah, give me, you know, Wilson IPA, give me this, give me that, whatever. There'll be two or three that are like, I don't drink beer. I'm just here because these other people are here and they're dragging me on this brewery tour. Um, and I'm like, well, would you like to try one? And one or two might want to try one. And the other one's just like, I hate beer. I don't like beer. I'm, you know, <laughs> like, all right, well, how about a seltzer? It's like, oh my God. And then all of a sudden they're like having a good time because they've got just as excited as everyone else. Yeah. So it has its, you know, it has its place and, um, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just, um, I think, you know, more than anything, the world of seltzer has just opened my eyes to, I think, you know, kind of what is possible in craft, you know, like what, like what are the products that craft breweries are going to be making in like five or 10 years? You know, because this is kind of like, this didn't exist three years ago right or three four years ago Wait, it's, it's not been a long time well now yeah. it's smoothie seltzers have you had oh a smoothie seltzer yet smooch <laughs> smooch uh well they may not get to call it that much longer really well there i mean there's a very popular brewery in pennsylvania that has a trademark lawsuit with them against right against them right now because they um they've been making heavily fruited smoothie sours named called smoogies for a much longer time. And they also make seltzers. So they've, and then smooths just recently started distributing in Pennsylvania. So now mm. there's a standing trade trademark battle. So, I mean, maybe the, who knows who will, who will win, but yeah. So stuff like that. Like I had one, I was at a sour festival a couple um, weekends ago and like i had one early in the morning and it was basically just the same as like a breakfast smoothie <laughs> i've been told i gotta try them. that sounds like an awesome hangover drink 
It probably would be because like th there's no taste of alcohol in it. All you can taste is the fruit puree. Um, so it gives you that little bit of hair of the dog without actually tasting any of the alcohol. Yeah. I just don't like how we can just put a ton of fruit puree into something and just say smoothie seltzer and we're supposed to <laughs> agree that it's a seltzer. Like, yeah, I drink that <laughs> seltzer because it's bone dry, crisp, and I can yeah. hug one. Yeah, that's not these seltzer. ones. I mean, if I put oh. a bunch of fruit puree in my soda stream, yeah, am I just making smoothie smoothie soda. seltzer water? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's crazy too, because I guess in Pennsylvania, you have to have the caloric, the nutritional information mm. on seltzers. So those smoothie seltzers are 320 calories. Oh, again, <laughs> one and done. <laughs> one and done. So and they kind of, they kind of throw that. Uh, What's that? I said, if I'm going to pound one of those, it better be like 9% alcohol. Yeah, I know. I think they're also low alcohol. I uh, 5% maybe? Yeah. They're definitely not high. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the world we live in now. <laughs> it sure is. Have you yeah. had, and I've, I've mentioned this multiple times lately, people are probably sick of me saying it, but uh, have you used prickly pear in anything? Because a prickly mm. pear seltzer tastes phenomenal. Mm. We, um, <laughs> there's only, I think, oh, about 26 breweries on, in the Wyoming Brewers Guild. Um, and we just brewed our most recent like kind of guild collaboration. Um, it's not very feasible for us to like get together and like do a collab because people are damn near on the other side of the state, which is like an eight hour drive, you know, of, of there's three breweries here in Jackson and, you know, the three of us are the top three largest producers. So selfishly we, you know, we've done collabs here in Jackson in the past, but I, I that's digressing. The, we did a wheat beer and we've each we've asked each brewery to select their own fruit and i think i'm doing prickly pear it is phenomenal in beer yeah. just something different it looks fun it's an ingredient i wanted to play with sounds cool too yeah it's fun to say alliteration is cool like i said <laughs> makes me think of blue from uh, the jungle book right wasn't he a big prickly pear guy mm. bear yeah. in the jungle book Maybe. i think you're right Recently got a Disney Plus uh, account, so my wife and I have been rewatching. <laughs> did they pay you to say that? Are no, they did. I, they did sponsored or paid advertisements. <laughs> Hashtag uh, sponsorship. Yeah. <laughs> so blues on my mind. It's prickly pear blue. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I just finished watching the uh, Mighty Ducks series. <sighs> oh. That's those are great. Phenomenal. For my my kids love them, but for some reason refuse to watch the original movies. I, but I, I've learned that there's no rhyme or reason to what they do and don't want to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Like if you like cheese pizza, why don't you like pepperoni pizza when I take the fucking pepperonis off? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that is a very good example. I I feel like you've lived through that. Yeah, <laughs> I too have had that because one kid <laughs> insists on one of them wants pepperoni pizza, the other one insists on cheese. But for some reason, there has to be two pizzas because it yeah. can't possibly just be pepperoni removed. They can't touch. <laughs> Well, gentlemen, uh, was there anything that you guys wanted to cover that I haven't touched on? I just think it's awesome what you're doing, man, and uh, you. spreading the word, getting people um, engaged, and uh, you know, I really appreciate being a part of it. So, thank you. You know, I always think about these things too. Like, if I won an Oscar, you know, and I had a couple seconds to to get out there. <laughs> Uh, it's really come to light for me as of late. We 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 promoted some people within the brewery. We've people want more. We've got this amazing amazing team, and you know we touched on this at the beginning of it, where the passion is there for us, and we've seen a lot of people not succeed working for us in our brewery because the passion wasn't there to just bite the bullet and recognize that if you want to work at a brewery, you're going to scrub a floor for ten hours, and maybe you'll be able to brew for an hour. 
Um, and so I just, I, I, it's great that Colby and I have been able to sit here, have a really fun, good conversation while there's other people, this amazing team behind us that believes in us and we believe in them. Um, so I just, I always love to give a big shout out to the, our team um, because Roadhouse is, is the epitome of a team. You know, we, we wouldn't be where we were without everyone who does everything they do. If I, if I ever find myself in Jackson Hole, I will definitely stop by. Um, I don't know how soon that would happen. but <laughs> Well, yeah. It might be a tough sell to the two, uh, the two women in this house that run everything. <laughs> <laughs> Do you make it to some of the events like CBC and GABF and stuff like that? or it, It's been – I've been to CBC. It's been a little while. I want to start going to those things more often than I have in the past. Okay. Uh, it's always a great place to meet up with people like Common Ground. Yeah. So, well, yeah, if, you I need find, to. if you find yourself, you know, headed that way, let us know because we'll, um, you know, we usually do pint nights and different events around town and things like that. So, love to hang. Well, so. hopefully they'll have it in D.C. again because then that's – ridiculously convenient for me yeah which i believe it it does rotate through dc every so many years right or am i think or was it just that one time no dc is a great venue for it so gavin is is heavily involved in a lot of stuff that happens with saber um, okay we 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 learned over a, a series of beers and whiskeys one night that the 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 BA does enjoy uh, DC. It's just set up well for, for anything, any large gathering yeah. like that, you know, just the nature of, of the nation's capital. So yeah, it's just like this area is just built for moving people in and out. Yeah. <laughs> big time, big time. But, but yeah, if you ever do make it to Jackson, you gotta let us know beer beers and, uh, and really good food will be on us and, you know, we'll get out. If you ski, come out and ski with us. If not, we'll do some rafting and biking you know, in the summer. So, Put it on your so list. I, good place to come. I used to really enjoy snowboarding, and I always did that. And I tried skiing once with my wife, and I made it halfway down. I took the skis off, threw them, and then retrieved them and walked out the rest of the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, once you once you snowboard, you can't go back. Yeah, I like like snowboarding came so naturally to me too. It was very easy. And I, for the life of me, could not even make it to, like a halfway down the hill. And it was the like the training like, where all the kids were practicing on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, hell so, yeah! Well, sorry for the technical difficulties at the beginning there. Um, oh no, no problem because the, oh. the the second half went perfect. Well, actually, way more than the second half. It was only a little bit in the beginning. Um, but yeah, so. For future reference, if you do this again anywhere, definitely use Colby's laptop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 100%. Um, well, cool, man. Yeah, thank you, gentlemen, so much for uh, your time. Um, and uh, thank you, everyone, for watching and listening. Cheers. <laughs>